Hi there everyone, welcome back to Higher Biology. Today we are finishing up Unit 2, Metabolism and Survival. So we're going to be talking about Kira 7, uh, the genetic control of metabolism. And this follows on quite nicely from Kira 6, the environmental control of metabolism. So back in Kira 6, we talked about the uses of microorganisms in industry, how to grow them and how to ensure their survival. Today we're going to talk about how we can manipulate this in a few ways. And before we go into it, it'd be good if you had a bit of a fresh knowledge of the genetic engineering part of National 5, because we're going to be going into quite a few bits of detail of this, but obviously at a deeper level. So going back to the previous key area, we talked about growing microorganisms and why we like to use them in industry. Now, the genome, so all the genetic information, of wild strains of microorganisms can be improved. And here's some of the reasons for that. It could be to improve their genetic stability. It could be to improve their ability to grow on low cost nutrients. So remember beforehand, we looked at things such as agar, uh, and you may have to give some extra nutrition to some different types of microorganism. It could be to improve that. It could be to increase the yield of that target compound that you're wanting to grow and you're wanting to extract. And it could be just to make it easier to actually harvest that target compound after your process in the fermenter. So all of these things you may want to actually improve these wild strains. Now there's a couple of different ways of doing this, of trying to improve the strains of microorganisms. The first one is called mutagenesis. And what this is, is exposing microorganisms to mutagenic agents. So mutagenic agents, you may remember from National 5, where we talked about uh, the cause of mutations, things like radiation and some chemicals. So you can expose these microorganisms to mutagenic agents deliberately in order to try and produce new improved strains. The other way of doing this is transferring genes from one organism into a microorganism. So taking the gene that you want and implanting it into a microorganism. And this is called recombinant DNA technology. And we're going to go into these words quite a bit throughout this lesson. So first of all, if we take a look at mutagenesis, uh, as I said, this is just exposing these microorganisms to these mutagenic agents with the aim to produce new improved strains. So like back in National 5, this includes forms of radiation such as UV light, or some mutagenic chemicals uh, to basically deliberately cause mutations. So you're blasting these microorganisms with uh, mutagenic agents such as radiation with the aim of causing a mutation which may produce an improved strain of microorganism. Now the issue here is that may produce. You're very much gambling on this. You may cause a bad mutation or you may cause a mutation that's had no real impact, but you may at some stage end up with an improved version due to these mutations. The more uh, progressive way of doing this and slightly more uh, reliable way of doing this is recombinant DNA technology. And this is where we can manipulate the genome of an organism by transferring genes that we want from one organism into a host microorganism. And this allows this new host microorganism to produce either the plant or animal protein that we want that's useful. So some examples that are on the screen just now are, uh, you can maybe Google these and have a, have a look at some of the case studies, are uh, golden rice that was produced by adding some of the nutrition from carrots into strains of uh, plants, uh, rice plants, and this was to aid the amount of vitamin E that people were receiving in areas that were very heavy on rice-based diets. So it was given an extra range of nutrition by taking that carotene-producing gene from carrots into rice, genetically modifying it in order, order to produce this. There's a lot of uh, different things in terms of food stuff. We talked previously at National 5 about the use of GM crops with um, tomatoes. So Originally, there was the use of transferring genes to improve the shelf life of tomatoes, which has been quite big. Uh, one of the main ones we talk about is insulin. So originally, insulin was taken from the pancreas of pigs. Uh, there were multiple issues such as allergies or moral grounds that made that a bit of an issue, uh, whereas now we're able to remove that gene that produces the insulin 
protein and we can produce that in a lab in order to make it medical grade. And there's even weird and wonderful versions such as the glow-in-the-dark Arabidopsis plant that we have on the right hand side here. So taking the luminescence gene from a firefly that makes them glow and implanting it into uh, a plant to make this a glow-in-the-dark plant effectively. So these are all a big range of what we can do, uh, but the point is, is how do we actually do this? So this is the process we're going to be looking at. So effectively what happens is this newly transformed host cell that we talked about, so adding this gene, now contains a combination of its own DNA. So it's a host that has its own DNA, but you've added a new source gene as well. And this is what we call recombinant DNA. So before we go any further into the process, I want you to know what recombinant actually means. So having the host DNA and the new gene, the new source genetic information joined together, uh, we talked to National 5 about uh, the gene being added to the plasmid. This is now called recombinant. It's a combination of both sources of genetic material. And we're going to use this word quite a lot. Now beforehand, as we go into the process of uh, recombinant DNA technology, we're going to be looking at some enzymes. So again, going back to National 5, we talked about how an enzyme is used to cut out a gene and cut open the plasmid, like scissors, and there's a gene, uh, an enzyme, sorry, that's used to glue that gene into the plasmid and acts like glue. Uh, we're now going to go into what those enzymes actually are. You need to know what they are. Uh, the first one is called restriction endonuclease. So quite a complicated name. Make sure you learn it. Make sure you're familiar with the term. And that's the sort of scissors in this operation. It cuts out this desired gene that you want from the donor DNA. So we identify that gene and we cut it out with restriction endonuclease. But we also use that restriction endonuclease enzyme in order to cut open the plasmid where we're going to insert this gene into. Now, secondly, I mentioned there is an enzyme that acts like glue. Now, from unit one, we've came across this enzyme before that likes to join fragments together. And it's the same enzyme. So we have ligase, which is used as a glue, which steals the desired gene into that plasmid. So make sure you remember these terms, you know which enzymes are used throughout this process. So let's go into what happens. Previously, we talked about cutting out the gene we wanted, which is great, but we also need to make sure we know where that gene is in order to find it and in order to cut it out with the restriction endonuclease. So first of all, what happens is the restriction endonuclease enzyme recognizes a specific target sequence of DNA bases, so where we're wanting to cut out this gene. And that target sequence is called the restriction site. So we go through this DNA strand, for example, we find the gene at this restriction site, and this is where the restriction endonuclease is then going to cut through it. Now, what it does as well, though, is this enzyme also cuts out a complementary sequence on the opposite strand of DNA. So remember, DNA is double-stranded, so it finds the restriction site on one strand, but it needs to cut out the complementary sequences on the other side as well. So it'll cut out both of these, and we then end up with this uh, specific area of interest, this gene that we wanted to be able to be cut out by restriction endonuclease. Now, as you can see in the diagram at the bottom, once we have cut out this area that we want, uh, we have these ends that have been cut off. Now, these ends are called sticky ends, and the sticky ends are what's going to be added in uh, to the plasmid. So again, we use the exact same restriction endonuclease because we want the same complementary strands on uh, the plasmid in order to cut out this area of a plasmid, again, like scissors, in order to insert this new gene. So it's important we use the same restriction endonuclease enzyme so that we have this complementary sticky ends on the gene and complementary sticky ends on the plasmid so they can match together, and they slot together. Then what we do, as we mentioned before, is this needs to be sealed. So we use the enzyme ligase to seal that DNA into the plasmid. So we now have a gene that we wanted to cut out with sticky ends on it, and then we have this complementary ends of the plasmid which have been cut open uh, where the gene is going to be added in, and the ligase just seals them together. Now, once that new uh, 
bit of DNA, that new uh, gene from the host DNA has been added into the plasmid. As we said beforehand, we now have the new source of genetic information and the original host plasmid. We now have recombinant DNA, which forms a recombinant plasmid. So remember, a combination of the host DNA and the new source gene. Now, uh, what we're going to do, one of the, the main things to remember, and people tend to forget about this as well, is what then happens throughout the process of genetic engineering that we talked about in National 5, is now that you have that new plasmid, or what we now call your recombinant plasmid, you need to put it into a whole cell. It can't just float about doing nothing and producing a gene. So if you remember, that information, that new genetic information, gets put into a, usually a bacteria cell. And the bacteria cell uh, will then take it in and it will uh, reproduce and produce more of them. Now, before we go into that stage of things, we need to talk about something called a vector. So a vector is a DNA molecule that is used to carry foreign genetic information into another cell. So in this case, it would be the plasmid. So that plasmid is taking this new, this foreign genetic information, and it's putting it into a plant cell. It's transporting it across, and that's what we call a vector in biology. Now, we've talked about recombinant plasmids, and we talked about plasmids as well in National 5. However, they could also be chromosomes. Uh, artificial chromosomes and recombinant plasmids can be used as vectors, and we'll talk about the differences between them fairly shortly. So in terms of plasmids, as I said, we tend to use plasmids quite a lot, but they are only capable of carrying small, small quantities of DNA, so small genes. However, artificial chromosomes are capable of carrying much longer DNA sequences. So it all comes down to how much DNA you need to add, how big this gene is that you want to uh, add uh, into this new host organism. So the main thing for you to remember is both plasmids and artificial chromosomes can both be used as vectors. They have a lot of similar parts that we're about to look at. But artificial chromosomes are preferable to plasmids in the use of a vector when a large fragment of foreign DNA needs to be inserted. So it's all down to the size that's passed on. If it's relatively small, use a plasmid. If it's larger, we use artificial chromosomes. Now, I said they're both similar in a lot of ways. They both contain this, uh, the same similar things, and we're going to talk about what these actually are. So whether it's a plasmid or a chromosome, they both contain restriction sites, which we've discussed. They have regulatory sequences. They have an origin of replication, and they have selectable markers. Now, these bits are a little bit complicated, so we're going to go into each one. Uh, so just make sure you take notes and you're familiar with what these do and the importance of them. So the restriction site is what we've talked about already. This is the target sequence of DNA where specific restriction in the nucleus is used to cut. So both types of vector have these. This is where the sequence is going to be cut out. Now, the regulatory sequence controls gene expression of, if you remember, uh, gene expression from unit one. This controls gene expression of the vector's own genes and DNA, but also now of the inserted gene. So both of them have these regulatory sequences. Now, one of the ones that's quite important here is the origin of replication, because remember, the whole point of this is that the vector should now be replicating once it is added into a whole cell, such as a bacteria. So an origin of replication is used to initiate that self-replication of the vector, so it allows replication to take place. Now, arguably the most important one out of these areas here that we do talk about is selectable markers. So a selectable marker is an antibiotic resistance gene. So antibiotic resistance is used to protect the microorganism from any sort of selective agent, so anything that's going to kill it or prevent its growth. Now, this ensures that only the microorganism with that vector will grow, because we're going to look at how we tend to um, control the spread of these uh, different microorganisms and also to test that the vector has been successfully taken in by the microorganism. So a selectable marker will give a form of resistance to an antibiotic uh, if that microorganism has taken in the vector. So just to give you a bit more information about this part, because this is quite important, scientists are able to tell if a host cell has taken up that vector, so whether that recombinant plasmid or the artificial chromosome, 
by adding these selectable markers. So imagine you have a plasmid and you've added in this gene that you want, but you've added in a selectable marker that allows resistance to a certain antibiotic. So we've got ampicillin as an example that we're using here. What you then do is once that vector has been taken in by a microorganism, if this has successfully worked, you would then flood this culture, which is in its growth media, with ampicillin, for example, or any sort of antibiotic. If those microorganisms have successfully taken in the vector, they will now have that selectable marker which allows resistance against that antibiotic. So they will survive, and you know they've taken in because they have survived. However, if a microorganism that has not taken in that vector select, um, successfully, they would not have resistance. So they would be killed off by the antibiotic simply because they do not have the selectable marker which allows resistance for that antibiotic. So it's a way for us to actually tell if that host cell has successfully taken up the vector for the new genetic information. Now in terms of regulation, this goes one step further because this, uh, the industry that does this is highly regulated because there's a lot of controversy, there's a lot of moral decisions, uh, especially in terms of genetically modified organisms and the possibility of them being released into the environment. So as a safety mechanism, you can also add in genes that prevent the survival of a microorganism in the external environment. So for example, you can add, it's almost a self-destruct button if uh, one of these microorganisms was to make its way outside the lab, it would not be able to survive. It couldn't survive it with your controlled um, growth medium that you have. Now finally, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about the bacteria that you can use in order to use as a host microorganism. So as I talked about beforehand, the part that's often forgotten about with genetic engineering is once you have that new recombinant plasmid or artificial chromosome, or what we're now calling a vector, that new uh, part of genetic information that's been added to the source plasmid, that needs to get put into a microorganism, usually bacteria, and then the bacteria grow, which also grows this new vector. Now, the problem is with bacteria is that proteins that are going to be produced need to be folded into that correct 3D structure to work properly. And we discussed this a little bit back down at Unit 1 when we talked about DNA, but in order to work properly, they must be in their active form. Now, sometimes proteins made in recombinant bacteria, so bacteria that have taken in that vector, uh, sometimes the proteins are incorrectly folded. If it's incorrectly folded, basically it's structure is the wrong way, it leads to an inactive protein. So that protein will not work. Now the way around this is using recombinant yeast cells. So if you remember, yeast cells are eukaryotic, but they can also have uh, plasmids. So they're sort of nice mixture between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So using a yeast cell can be used to produce correctly folded proteins, which make them active forms, which make them work. And the whole idea being that they can still take in these plasmids, but yeasts are eukaryotic and they're basically more complex machinery. So they're able to handle more complicated proteins and they're able to produce more complicated proteins. So that's one thing for you to be aware of. Why would you use a yeast cell um, as a host microorganism for a vector rather than bacteria? Because yeast cells are eukaryotic, they're more complex and they can produce uh, more complicated proteins which are going to be correctly folded and are going to be active. So there's quite a lot of information in this key area. Uh, thanks so much for listening and I hope you've found this useful. I would definitely go back and make sure you know the stages of this new form of genetic engineering that becomes the DNA technology. Compare it to mutagenesis and also make sure you compare the different types of vector and different types of host microorganism and why you would use either. Uh, and that is it for the whole of Unit 2. That's us finished metabolism and survival. Um, now I've got some videos ready to go up for the start of Unit 3. You'll find that there's a few similarities between Unit 3 in Higher and in National 5, but we're going to be starting off by looking at food production, crop growth, and then into photosynthesis. So thank you much for following all these videos so far. I really have been appreciating your comments and you taking your time out to say you found them useful. Hope you're all doing well 
This video has been good for you and I will speak to you soon with Kia 3.1. Thanks so much for listening everyone.